John Lydon is part Johnny Rotten and part sweet, cuddly John Lydon. And you're never quite sure which one's going to turn up. Ah, and I get the feeling you've been cheated. He lost his mother very early. He lost Sid Vicious, his great friend. And so he's had a lot of tragedy in his life to deal with. I'm here for the fun. Have fun. I've never gone into an interview fearing there is a high possibility of getting a clump in the face from Johnny Rotten's right fist. Hello, Pierce. Nice of you to do this show with me. Enjoy. Or endure. Pierce bombs away, then, is it? <laughs> John Lydon, Johnny Rotten, you are, you are a music icon, you're a cultural icon, and you're the only person who's ever come into one of his interviews clutching a black plastic bag. Oh, I'm sensible. I like cheap little bags. I carry all my stuff around in it, and I feel better than a man bag. What, what's in there? <laughs> uh, toilet roll. <laughs> <laughs> A ciggies. Yeah. Oh, go on, have a butcher's. I will have a butcher's. Thank you. You'd... Wait, he a... sees the underpants. T-shirts. <laughs> uh, underpants. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Wow. La Creme... Mer. Creme de la Mer. <laughs> Love it. Most expensive skin cream in the world. And I didn't have to pay because you lot dedicated that to me. <laughs> For not dealing with the makeup department. Do Thank you... you very much. No, you... I keep the keys, uh, my money, my cigarettes, just things I need, right? It's like a practical. Solution. Have you always done that? Always carried a bag? Always, yeah. I don't like uh, designer bags or, or briefcases or any of that. It's just convenient. I was told by the production team John doesn't want any makeup, no, no yeah. hair, he's, yeah. he's fine as he is. Yeah. You just rocked up with your bag, yeah. you stood outside chain smoking, and you came on, that's yeah. it. Yep. The only guest we've ever had that's done that. Well, you don't need all that rest of stuff, do you? I don't, anyway. You, you have no real vanity, then? No, I come with wrinkles and all, and there it is. <laughs> I'm trying to hide the beer belly, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's an extraordinary statistic, but it's, it's 40 years since the Sex Pistols erupted onto social consciousness. Ah. What do you think of that? I haven't thought about it in terms, like, years. Only 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing length of time. I, mean, well, I remember it vividly. We became so big so quick that it was uh, too earth-shattering to really deal with sensibly. Um, we had no prospects of fame and all of that. And uh, I think that shows. And that's why the quality of the Sex Pistols is still there. How did you get the name Johnny Rock, which is what you've become, obviously, world famous Oh, for? bad teeth. Absolute. Uh, a touch of national health mm. and a touch of absolute laziness. I mean, uh, in my childhood, we, the only time I ever seen a toothbrush used was my dad cleaning his boots. Mm. Um, so it was, there was bits missing, all cracked up. I'd avoid the dentist. I mean, Mum and Dad had dentures, so, you know... I, that was a, a big childhood memory, was their false teeth in glasses. Oh, and of course, the older oh, Friday nights when they'd run parties and, uh, you know, all the, all the other relatives are uh, all losing their teeth. I mean, I spent half my childhood picking up dentures. <laughs> <laughs> and who's yours, Mummy? <laughs> Who first called you Rock? Who gave you the nickname? Steve Jones, because hmm. of the teeth. To a member of the Pistols? Yeah. Was that before the band got together? Was it when you were mates? Or... Uh, that was almost immediately on our first meeting. You're rotten, you are. Well, hello, why not? Did you like the nickname? Did you see the, the, the potential for it? I liked it a lot, yeah. Because it, it was uh, not taking yourself too serious. I guess a lot of people still call you or ref you as Johnny Rotten. Does that bother you? No, it's a privilege. I'm, I'm well earned. That's really neat. I like it. Because I did no wrong. Ain't nothing rotten about me. In 2008, you had your teeth fixed. Finally had to, because uh, the problems that came from uh, 
And this is why I recommend you brush your teeth, everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it ended up costing me something nearly, oh, $20,000, right? It was... The damage was so bad that I had holes in the bones from the abscesses. And uh, I've had practically everything uh, removed and replaced. <laughs> they look great now, but they've obviously... And, yeah, but they're not. If you look at them properly, mm. right, they're kind of like... Uh, as some of my mates describe them as car park bollards. <laughs> right? They're kind of concrete grey. So I didn't go for that deaf white look. No. I wanted them to match the little bit I had left <laughs> from my youth. Just to start, though, you're one of the most influential figures in British music. Uh, what is interesting about you, I think, for those who don't know you, is you such an eclectic range of musical tastes that you have. And we've made a little list here. Mozart, Status Quo, the Bee Gees, Cool and the Gang. Why yeah. Mozart? Requiem. Absolutely. But, Just But why? It. What does it do to you? breaks me up inside. It just hits in all the right emotional places. It's the saddest, saddest death dirge. It's dedicated to the death of his father. Just beautiful. Insanely excellent. And so superb because it's not finished. Which is the answer to death. What is death? It doesn't have a finished conclusion. Perfect for me. You go from Mozart to status quo. Quite a leap. Musically, oh, what state? Why quo. do you love quo? Oh my god, what they do with three notes. Just... <laughs> <laughs> you never liked the Beatles very much. Well, Mum and Dad played them way too much, you know, and so the, the, the prejudice was set in there. I just, uh, you know, one more time of that awfulness. You, you're driving through London, and Paul McCartney is also there and wants to meet you. What happens? Oh, that was terrible. I was, I was with my wife, Nora, and we were going to visit my brother in Tottenham, and uh, we had to go through uh, past Harrods, and two people come running across the street, and it's Paul and Linda McCartney, and they're banging on the cab window. <laughs> I put the lock down and... <laughs> <turn it. laughs> I could not cope with it. It was too much. Uh, this is, you know... A famous person. Yeah, this is like the most famous. I, person I couldn't on handle the it. Listen, my shyness took over. But you just sped off in your cab, leaving the world's number one yeah, music that. superstar. Yeah, with the cab, there. with the cab driver guy. Bleed now! I've seen it all now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Nora going, oh, why don't you let them in? No. <laughs> How does, how does... It's, you know when things take you sometimes by surprise? <laughs> Bang, it's Paula Linda. <laughs> it's I'm, told, I'm told you, got, you get stage fright sometimes so badly always, you, you always, throw up. Always, yeah, yeah, terrible. Literally, you throw yeah, up. Yeah, no, I can't eat before a gig. Can't. Panic, nerves, fear. Don't want to let people down. But once I get on stage, for instance, oh, there's no shyness at all, right? Mr Rotten is full on it. But that's like I was kind of made to be that, but I was also made to be this shy person also. One works well with the other. In your 40 years of fame, you've never been afraid to rock the boat. Hello, poor people. John Lydon, rock revolutionary and true Great Britain. You can't be of my generation of English and not be influenced by John. You're looking at me. Now that's naughty. He was mouth almighty. And he probably still is, and he's really good at it. It's a joke. It's a farce. John uh, is and was an incredibly uh, talented individual. He's wild. It's almost like, you know, a wild animal. As well as storming the music establishment with his bands The Sex Pistols and Pill... There's so many two-bob sods out there that want to sound like me. John has also rocked the world of TV. I'm a celebrity! Get me out of there! Giving us reality TV moments... <laughs> ..and wildlife programmes to remember. Did you see the teeth on that? <laughs> John first burst onto the scene 40 years ago as a penniless 19-year-old when he was chosen as the front man of a revolutionary new band called the Sex Pistols. What he had was this powerful way of staring at you and fixing you in 
his gaze. I'm going to get inside your soul. I'm going to change you. In 1976, the group released their first single, Anarchy in the UK, and went on an early evening chat show to publicise it. Punk rockers. The new craze, they tell me. It's what? Nothing, a rude word. Next question. No, no. What was the rude word? Shit. Say uh, something outrageous. You dirty bastard. Go on, again. <laughs> you dirty <laughs> Never heard swearing like that. Live. No, 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 no. British youth had new heroes. Two days after that, maybe, school, uh, people changed their hair, started to see um, pins all over the place, zips, and you know, people turn into punk rockers, man. Sex Pistols sent shockwaves through the establishment. I think most of these groups would be vastly improved by sudden death. The worst cult they are, the Sex Pistols, um, they are the antithesis of humankind. Terrible, I think it is. I think it's disgusting. Local authorities up and down the country banned the Sex Pistols from playing. Couldn't play. Cancelled, 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 cancelled. Too hot to handle, the Pistols were also dropped by the record label. Richard Branson's Virgin stepped in. The Sex Pistols actually put Virgin on the map. You thought you'd gotten rid of us, didn't you? But you were wrong, old B, because we're back. All the outrage and attempts to ban the Pistols simply gave them more publicity and boosted record sales. God save the queen, the fascist regime. Their first single with Virgin was God Save the Queen, released to coincide with the Silver Jubilee in June 1977. God save the queen. The Royal Flotilla was due to sail the Thames, so for a publicity stunt, the band organised their own musical boat trip. It ended when the police brought them into the dock at Westminster and moved in to make arrests. The dirty beast was waiting, the yeah, police. Yeah. In the end, at the end of the day, just for like a boat trip. Police should not have raided the boat. Because the Sex Pistols would be no interest in this, in this, in this boat tonight. As a result, I think made, made the Pistols all the more notorious. Johnny Rotten, star of the Sex Pistols, was public enemy number one. He was the poster boy for it. The guy who's the, the rebel, the guy you want to be like. One of the most startling, destructive, brilliant, expressive, creative figures to have emerged not just in Britain, but across the whole world. It's an absolute tragedy. I've ended up something of a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. So you wake up and you're public enemy number one. What's going through your mind? What an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> Did well, you like it? Was it a thrill? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, normally I suppose most people in the world would, like, uh, be very fearful of that. Oh, I loved it. I thought, you know, if you can't get them all to love you, well, you can go the opposite. What was the ethos of you and the Pistols at the time that you think really hit a nerve with the youth? Well, I suppose we disliked each other so much that that was going to come out in the music, and... Uh, and that anger and that, that resentment and confusion you have as a teenager, well, we have exemplified that. Did you become a, a, a physical target to people who wanted to make a name for themselves? Oh, yeah, yeah. Lot, lots of uh, attacks. It became impossible to do what I always loved to do, which is run around on my own and get up to my own, like, situations, because it, it would be gangs. What would they, what would they do to you? Just try and smash me to pieces, cut me up. Uh, got razored a few times, bottle put in my head, and cuts around here, to try and just gouge out my eye. I got a, a machete, ripped through the jeans. Lucky, uh, just stuck on the bit of the knee bone there. Could have torn the muscle out. Really, really extreme violence. Did you? Did it make with, with you? With nonsense like we love our queen, you know. Mm. Well, I never said I didn't either, you know. I just don't like the institution. When the police boarded your Jubilee boat, they apparently uh, uttered the immortal words, where's Johnny Rotten? Oh, yes. Do you remember how you responded? I did. I pointed to Richard Branson. <laughs> 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 so I'm amazed he was on there tonight, but hello, well done, Richard. How, does it, how do you it feel? It still when... looks like Guy Fawkes. <laughs> When you see Richard Branson paying tribute to you and saying, really, that the whole Virgin Empire yeah. really was, was 
brought up on the pistols. What do you think about that? I think he belittles Mike Oldfield's tubular belt. <laughs> <laughs> now, the height of your fame, uh, John, you said, as the so-called king of punk, I was getting almost too much sexual attention suddenly. Oh, yeah, very shy about that. I mean, I've always considered myself hideously ugly and deformed. You know, the hunchback that I had for really... Uh, can you notice it? <laughs> Did you start to embrace the groupie culture? <laughs> Not when the camera was on. <laughs> <laughs> you described sex as two minutes of squelching noises. <laughs> Originally, yeah, that's what every teenager thinks, isn't it? Have things I, improved over the years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a few years later, I realised it was five minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> of seconds. <laughs> when that memory comes back and it clicks, oh, my God, that's it, my mum. How could I have not recognised her? Back to where it all started. You were born John Joseph Lydon in January 1956. Your parents were John and Eileen, who were both Irish immigrants, and you had three younger brothers, Bobby, Jimmy and Martin. Martin. What was life like in the, in the household? Uh, well, we only had two rooms. Uh, the uh, toilet was an out outdoors one in the backyard, which was open to the public. What is the reality of living in such cramped conditions when there are so many people there? Closeness is a good thing. It, 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 I think it ties you together far more importantly than separating. I, I, I think it's a very, very good thing for parents to be in the same room as very young children. The bond is then forever. When you were seven years old, you were diagnosed with meningitis. Do, do you remember anything about the build-up to it or not? Um, intense, serious headaches that are... So severe, it's just absolutely beyond even screaming in pain or crying. But that was the fluid in going into the brain. I did not know that. You're and seven uh, years old, you're getting these terrible headaches. You go into hospital. In, in hospital for a year, uh, at the coma for four months, nearly four months, or thereabouts, uh, and then uh, woke up uh, not knowing who I was at all. No memory of anything. I couldn't even walk or talk or, or nothing, zero. And yet inside, I wanted to communicate, but physically couldn't. Um, to be able to come back and find out who I really was took uh, the next four years. And I had to completely believe in what every human being was saying to me in order to find out who I was. And, and that stuck with me to this day. That's why I can't tolerate liars. I depended on these two strangers telling me they were my parents to believe that. And uh, I was uh, a, a very, very worried uh, kid at between seven going on eight, leaving that hospital, thinking that I was always part of that institution. And they were selling me off to two complete strangers. I had to believe I belonged somewhere. Right. But, I mean, terrifying for your parents. I would say, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it... I know I shouldn't feel guilt about it, but when I look back on it, I, the pain they must have, like, gone through, you know, because I knew what I was going through. I just did not know them. And, so you, and you wake so up. So years later, when, when that memory comes back and it clicks, my God, it, that's my mum. How could I have not recognised her? How long did it take you to realise these were your parents? Um, a couple of years drifting in and out. My dad took longer. He, he, uh, he it seemed to me to be this, this really nasty, aggressive person, and he wasn't at all. It was just his gruff way. I mean, he was very young, my dad, you know, when they had me. Very young. Did your full memory return so that yeah. you could remember everything that had... Everything, and quite amazing how much of it came back. Even things that I suppose in normal life I, I wouldn't have remembered. It's, it's, it's an odd thing, the memory, how it could be stolen from you. Mm. But it's always in there somewhere. It's just a matter of unlocking it. Would you have been the creative, energetic tour de force that you became without that? I don't know, but let's say it helps. It really does. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it strengthens your character. 
John, your rise to fame was fast and furious. I am John, and I was born in London. John grew up on the estates of North London and from an early age liked to look different. John stood out like a beacon. Mm -hmm. He stood out like a beacon <laughs> in, 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 in more ways than one. John's dad was very strict. Um, John wasn't allowed to dye his hair. He got thrown out, I think, for dyeing it green. You look so bloody boring. I think John's mum was a little bit more kind of laid back and chilled. Um, she also used to knit these mohair jumpers, which John wore. Um, in the 70s and when the Pistols were famous. Johnny's mum were very, 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 very close. He loved his mum and she loved him. As frontman of the Sex Pistols, John, along with his best mate John Simon Ritchie, known as Sid Vicious, created a whole new iconic look. I would get T-shirts and I'd buy zips and I'd sew t the zips into the T-shirts and then cut them. Safety pins in the ears. What's your dress made from? <laughs> It was like a party atmosphere, but with this sinister undertone because he was going to be the ringmaster. The Pistol's scary image and notoriety meant no venues would book them for gigs. So, at the beginning of 1978, manager Malcolm McLaren took them to America. To me, it seemed really odd that they did an American tour at all. I think they're uh, sickening and disgusting. They went to yeah. Texas. Yeah. They went to the Long Horn <laughs> Ballroom. They went to places no one's seen anyone with, with <laughs> dodgy air. Yeah. You've got to have a pair of nuts to go yeah, down to go there and, yeah. and play in them gaffs. Yeah. But backstage, tensions were high. John was arguing with Malcolm McLaren and best friend Sid, who had a heroin addiction. John had had enough of Malcolm and just, I think, couldn't, couldn't stand um, continuing with him anymore. You'll get one number and one number only, cos I'm a lazy bastard. The band's gig in San Francisco on the 14th of January 1978 was to be John's final performance with oh, the Sex Pistols. Why should I carry on? Ah, ha, ha. Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? He had enough. Yeah. You could see that. If you, you watch footage of it, he had enough. You split up with the Pistols, now you're occupying your time. Boringly. Would you like to start another band? Yes, I am. Within six months of leaving the Pistols, John was back with his new band, Public Image Limited, also known as Pill. After the breakup of the Sex Pistols, the, the, you, you did get excited about what John Lydon was going to do next. Punk had dried up musically, so you wanted something strange and, and peculiar and unexpected, and he, he, he did it. He, he, he invented a new kind of way of making music. But as their first single hit the top ten, John was dealing with tragedy in his private life. His mother, Eileen, had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was awful, it was awful, because his mum was so special, you know what I mean? She passed away in November 1978, at the age of just 46. John was a bit of a mummy's boy, so I think it was quite a, you know, difficult period when she passed. Then, just over two months later, John suffered another terrible blow. Star Sid Vicious is dead after taking an overdose of heroin last night. It was a dark period for John, but there was, funny enough, in it, as always, there was humour in that, you know. We had a mate work in the film game, and John got a load of props, and he turned his room and it, into, like, Highgate Cemetery. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, and slept yeah. in it like that. Yeah, yeah. But it was like living in, live, literally living in a crypt. His mum had died. Sid Vicious is dead. You know, there's this huge come down off, off, off the, 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 the insane mountain top that was the Sex Pistols. He had to keep going. You know, he couldn't stop, so sometimes he was running on empty. You were just 22 years old, though, and you've just lost your mother and your close friend, uh, Sid. I want to talk, first of all, about your, your mum. Did you feel cheated that you lost her so young? Did you feel angry? What were your emotions at the time? It's, it's the worst thing in the world to um, visit, I suppose, anybody you know in any way at all, but when it's as close as a parent, to hear them say, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to beat this, it's... 
Oh. You mean knowing that the chances are they can't be Inevitable. Yeah. And, and to know she was dying in such pain, just such pain, and didn't want the, uh, the painkillers. Did you feel cheap? Because they make you lose your mind. Your dad died in 2008, so he saw your career develop and all the twists and turns. Did he go from being terrified by what he saw to enjoying the ride in the end? Yeah, but my dad was an absolute teaser. So his way would always be, why don't you just write a hit single, Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that that would annoy the hell out of me. <laughs> It's, it's odd, it was only towards the end of his life that uh, I sussed his humour and just how funny it was, very dry. I always thought he was just, like, just nasty, and it's not at all. There's a great sense of wit in him. You've and and, and I, I tell you, I, I see it in myself sometimes. I say things and I realise that's, that's my dad there talking. Let's turn to, to Sid Vicious. Um, he died of a heroin overdose on the 2nd of February, 1979. Inevitable. And Sid was my mate and all that, but I watched him slowly destroy himself, so I've got, I got to be honest, uh, I, it came as no surprise. It wasn't o overwhelmingly catastrophic, because he'd killed himself, as indeed most people who mess about with heroin, mm. they, they, they lose their souls way, way, way earlier. It's just waiting for the body to finally keel over. Sid had been accused of murdering his, yeah, his girlfriend, yeah. Nancy. What was your reaction to that? Impossible to believe. Yes, it's, it's, no, he's just not a violent person. Sidney couldn't fight his way out of a crisp bag, poor thing. It's just... But maybe the heroin, I don't know, but I couldn't imagine him killing his girlfriend for any particular reason. What do you think probably happened? I think they had a, a bit of a problem with the drug dealers and owed far too much money, which is a much more likely scenario. Were you ever big into the drug scene or not? No. Anything that keeps me awake is fine, but no kind of drug that has any uh, suppressant or downer in it. It's, um, it's to this day, uh, I still... I have troubles going to sleep at night. I, I'll fight to the bitter end until I quite literally pass out, because... I've always still got that thing I might wake up and not remember who I am. That's, uh... You yeah. still live with that fear? Oh, yeah. There's nothing worse than that, to absolutely not belong to anybody. Uh, that's, that's the ultimate pain. This might be the most damning allegation so far, that you're a lovely, nice person. <laughs>
And up I trot on stage, do my Sex Pistols bit, and I think a song and a half later, uh, I dehydrated so quickly uh, that I passed out and had to be cut out of it. And that really annoyed me. And I used safety pins to put it back together. <laughs> John, music hasn't been the only passion in your life. As the 1980s dawned, John was taking on new musical challenges. The thing that I think he's most proud of, post Sex Pistols, it was his opportunity to be as creative as he possibly could be. We ain't no band, we're a company. Simple. Nothing to do with rock and roll. Pill were much more experimental and ahead of, them, ahead of the time. Hate it or love it, it doesn't matter. It was the whole way, you know, the combination of sound, studio, electronics, avant-garde influences. And it's still innovative when you play it today, it's fresh. John had also met and fallen in love with a German woman, Nora Forster. Just inside and out, Nora has always been a beautiful woman, do you know what I mean? They've got such a close relationship, he absolutely worships her. They're meant for each other, them yeah. two. Nora moved with John to the US to set up a new life in LA. The extremes of the United States of America appeals to him, you know, and the sort of absurdity of the culture. John lives in a really cool part of LA where it's just like very eccentric millionaires, somewhere where someone like Johnny Lydon can walk around and not really be noticed. He and Nora lead a very private life, you know? They're an extraordinary couple. Well, don't you find it ironic that they've been together for, you know, nearly 35 years, absolutely devoted to each other, and yet his image is anti-establishment. He's always challenged convention, and yet, secretly, he's very conventional. You know, I think that's probably the shocking truth, is that he's actually a very normal, unusually sensitive, highly creative, nice, loving person. That might be the scandal. He is lovely, yeah. <laughs> he is nice. <laughs> he's not, he's, he just, he makes that he's not. No, he's lovely. I mean, this might be the most damning allegation so far, that you're a lovely, nice person. I think I'm completely misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, absolutely loving your partner is it doesn't make you conventional or or, or 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 an anarchist or anything at all. That's a reality for me. I love the people I work with, I love the people I, that are my family members, and I particularly love Nora. We are just made in heaven. We are so awkwardly different. It's uh, best person in the world I've, Where I've ever known. Where did you meet Nora? Uh, I think it might have been a Sex Pistols gig and uh, she was told terrible things about me and uh, that absolutely drew her straight to me. <laughs> um, and we had a huge row. And, and from that, you know, at the end of the uh, kept slinging insults, burst out into laughter. And that's how our life has been ever since. We have really volatile moments and then just can't keep up the, 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 the negative momentum because there's, there's so much more going on. What did your dad say when you first took her home? Do you remember? Oh, my God, Johnny, she's old enough to be going out with me. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Oh, f f fancy your chances, Daddy. She's 14 years older than you? Yeah. Does that matter? Has it ever Not mattered? Not at all. Have you ever do. noticed the age difference? No. You're a toy boy, basically. Oh, love it. <laughs> are you are you a bit of an old softy behind closed doors? Are you a romantic? I am a complete huggy bunny. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> yep. A huggy bunny. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, I I never thought I'd use about you. Are you romantic? Do you do romantic? I'm very romantic, but not in the way you'd think. It, it's not flowers on deliberate occasions. It would be a uh, spur of the moment kind of thing. Like what? Well. I mean, nor at the moment, you can't buy tights in L.A., so I'm going to go to Harrods tomorrow and get her a few pairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a very romantic <laughs> thing to do. Well, there's a necessity, and so I, I, I meet the need, and that's how we are. You and Nora had an extraordinarily fortunate escape from certain death. Oh, Tell me about that. Pan Am. 
Yes, the Lockerbie flight. We were booked onto that. And, uh, and I've always moaned to Nora, because she should be so slow on timing. She's always late for everything, and she hadn't packed the case. And uh, it was obvious we were going to miss the flight, so we just thought we are flying out the next morning. I didn't bother to tell anyone. And then, of course, we went back to bed, being what we are. Um, and then everybody presumed we were dead, because the Lockerbie flight went down. What what is the secret, John, of a long-lasting relationship? Never mind marriage, just yeah. a relationship. Do you really think? seriously good open rows. Really? Yeah. Say everything, throw it all out, and then have a great sense of humour about being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still here, and the rest of them, what, what are still alive, nice bit of jail time for them. Jail time. <laughs> What a completely turn left field here. An unbroadcast section of a BBC Radio interview you did in 1978 recently came to light, included on a, a Pill album. And you were talking about making a film where you kill famous people. Now, this has never been played on television before, but it has a particular uh, relevance. Let's listen to this. So who else is on the goner list? Oh, it's endless, believe me. I just want to make a film of it. On film, I'd like to kill Jimmy Savile. I think he's a hypocrite. When I write... I bet he's into all kinds of seediness that we all know about but we're not allowed to talk about. I know some rumours. <laughs> I bet none of this will be allowed out. I shouldn't imagine libelous stuff will be allowed out. Nothing I said is libel. <laughs> Sounds a bit harsh, the Deaf list there. Well, but actually... Sometimes you, you're contentious in life just because you're bored of that pro that. But, but that put aside that, for, put aside the, the, the rhetoric you were using, the fact that in 1978, at the height of the Sex Pistols explosion, there you are saying about Jimmy Savile, he was into all kinds of seediness that we all knew about, we weren't allowed to talk about it, I know some rumours. So you, you had heard the kind of thing that we now know about him or, yeah. or stuff like that? Yeah. I think most kids did too. Most kids wanted to go to the top of the pops, but we all knew what that cigar muncher was up to. But I'm very, very bitter that the likes of Savile and the rest of them were allowed to continue. Did you ever try and do anything about Savile? I did my bit. I said what I had to. Did they air that? No. It just got suppressed. Yeah. For, for legal reasons. Yeah. And uh, did you meet? I, I found did you myself. Meet? I found myself being banned from BBC Radio there for quite a while for my contentious behaviour. Because of that... They wouldn't state this directly. There'd be other excuses. I mean, it's shocking. Oh, it? yeah. He got away with it for another 30-odd years. Well, not only him, a whole bunch of them. And these are the purveyors of good taste, huh? You were too offensive. Brilliant, isn't it? Well, I'm still here, and the rest of them, what, what are still alive, nice bit of jail time for them. Jail time! <laughs> I have to read this. Uh, the BBC has said it's appalled by Savile's crimes and that the Dame Janet Smith Review is considering the culture and practices of the BBC during that period. John Lydon, your public image has taken you from the stage to the jungle with a bit of butter thrown in for good measure. Just peace or peace off. As he turned 40, John was as anarchic as ever. He's created a, a, a life for himself where he can do what he wants to do. He doesn't give a shit what you think. If you don't like it, sod off. By the mid-90s, aspects of John's life were coming full circle. The Sex Pistols reformed for a reunion tour. Hello, my name's John. I'm here to represent the Sex Pistols, a band I used to be in and still am when it suits me. You're only 29. I think he has an urge as a musician probably to make music and tour and create and I think sometimes it's put into bed a lot of 
stuff that's kind of needed to be resolved. Screen stardom also beckoned. John's appearance on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here had more than 10 million people tuning in. Oh! Every now and again, Johnny Rotten would pop out and try and blow his nose with no handkerchief. <laughs> Do you have to do that, John? Do you have to do that? And then he'd become this lovely, quite sophisticated, deep-thinking guy again. John's got a lot to answer for, but he's got a lot to be appreciated for, too. <laughs> Look at me, I'm so at one with nature. <laughs> People out there who didn't know much about John, who didn't know much about what the music he was in and stuff like that, got to know a little bit more about John as a person. John's new mainstream popularity led to TV presenting roles. You keep that camera pointed there, right? I'm an ugly old sod, but, you know, what you're about to see is a proper set of dentures. Just when you think you know what he's going to do, it'll do something completely different. Do I buy country life butter because it's British? And there were advertising contracts. And there's the voice of the revolution, you know, advertising butter in the most <laughs> hilarious way. People could say, oh, he's selling out. You know what I mean? But the message I got from it is, you know, if Johnny Lydon says this butter's nice, then it, it, it's nice. With the money he made from his media commitments, John relaunched his band, Pill. I want the trouble, 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 and the double, 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 give me trouble. Now John and Pill are back in the studio with a single, Double Trouble, from the new album, What the World Needs Now. I think Pill continues to sort of evolve in a way. I think in some ways, in some of the reformings of Pill, he's had such, such fantastic musicians that it's actually got better. You know, the music's got better. He built a, a very solid career over, over many years, producing, um, you know, producing great music. You cannot refute how original he is. When you see him perform, it's not just about music. Do you see what it means to a lot of people? They're so passionate about what he means because he's probably done so much for a generation, so it's, you know, it's almost like he was their voice. <laughs> Everybody know John. Everybody know John. Brother to the end, you know? Much I love, much I love. Thank you. Do you think the pill is producing, as someone suggested there, ever better music because of the quality of the musicians you have involved? Yeah, well, they became uh, uh, quality acts because we endured so long. I mean, you're bound to improve. <laughs> <laughs> I did that myself. I mean, I think I went a hell of a lot further down the field now because I didn't give up. I kept at it. What's next for Pill? A newer album after this new album. What we do now is, uh, and it's, we find it works very well, is uh, we make the money by touring, and that money that we've made then goes into recording, and then the cycle continues. It's very healthy that way. Do you still feel slightly anarchic? I don't suppose I ever did. I, I don't understand anarchy in that way, because it seems to be, to me, mind games for the middle class. So you're not really an anarchist, are you? I don't believe in anarchy for the sake of it, no, because uh, you're just ultimately destroying something with nothing to replace it. That's just sheer spite and destruction. Do you feel and when also, you're... when I see anarchists, I mean, I'm appalled. Mm. You go to these anarchist marches, yeah. they're all wearing designer boots, trousers, rugsacks, cell phones, mm. and they fly around the country and corporate airlines to do it. They're a disgrace to anarchists, aren't they? They absolutely are. <laughs> And I don't, I don't like anything that offers a negative to other human beings. I don't find that to be very useful. Anarchy, it's irony. I'm well, neither pretty or vacant. What, what would your message be to those pseudo-anarchists who preach the violence and everything else? <sighs> Have yourself filmed and show it to your mum and dad to see how smug you feel then. <laughs> how would you like to be remembered? Uh. I don't know if I want a grave or any of that or a tombstone. I think uh, the best and most decent thing I could do would be to donate my body to, uh, well, anybody that wants a spare part. <laughs> <laughs> Q.
queue up for the Johnny Rotten body parts. Yes, I wouldn't recommend you buy the penis. <laughs> I will have your teeth, if it comes to it. <laughs> there are none left. <laughs> John, it's been fantastic talking oh, to you. Thank you for having us. Now I can rush off to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> John Ryder, please. <laughs>